Today, we're going to be copying somebody else's work. That's right, we're cheating. But that's okay, because sewing's hard enough as it is, and it's nice to have shortcuts. I want to make this waistcoat. The problem is, I picked this waistcoat up in a charity shop, second hand, and having looked up the company who makes the waistcoat, they no longer stock it, and good luck trying to find another one in a charity shop. Chances of that are very slim. I like the way this one fits, for the most part. I like its proportions, I like the fabric it's made out of, but because I wear this almost every day, and have done for quite a long time now, it's in need of some repair, need a new lining, that sort of thing, so I need to take it apart. The trouble is, I haven't got another waistcoat that's as versatile as this one that's currently in my wardrobe. Or rather, I didn't, but I'm now wearing it. I'm going to take you through the process loosely for how to copy a garment that you've got that you like, that you can no longer get hold of. You'll need some paper of some description. Pattern paper is best if you can get hold of it, but wrapping paper, even printer paper, will do. As long as it's good, lightweight paper, you're fine. You'll also need some fabric to make the garment out of. If you're just starting, I would strongly recommend using some cheap polycotton. Don't spend a lot of money on this. Uh, get your eye in with it and use some cheap fabrics. Have a play about with it. Don't worry too much about what the final garment looks like until you've had a practice run. If you've got a bit more experience, you'll probably be able to follow along fairly well and understand what I'm doing. I imagine you've also got some different techniques, perhaps even better techniques than I'm using. And I would welcome comments on that below. I'm learning just as much as everybody else is. The fabric I'm using, I would not recommend if you are a starter when it comes to making garments. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend them even if you have some experience because I made a little bit of a mistake on that front. I wanted to make this out of fabric I'd already got to hand. I wanted something that would fit with most of what I already have in the wardrobe and I have this pinkish velvet which I bought for the red coat and turned out to be the wrong colour. There was enough of this to make the waistcoat and of course with velvet there's a bit more wastage because it's a directional fabric because of the pile. Fabric that also likes to move quite a bit when you're sewing it and when you're pinning it and leaves fluff everywhere when you've trimmed it. I love velvet, I hate working with it and of the people that I know who sew they all have the same opinion of velvet. At least, thank goodness, this is a cotton velvet and not a stretch velvet. That's a whole other set of nightmares. The lining fabric I've used, again, is leftover fabric that I've had in the box for a while. I'm not sure what it is. It might be a rayon, it might be a crepe of some description. I really don't know. If you can figure it out from the video, please do let me know um, so that I can avoid it in the future. <laughs> It's such a mobile fabric in a completely different way to the velvet that it really did give me quite a lot of work just to keep everything where it needed to be. I am astonished this waistcoat turned out as well as it did given the fabric I'm working with. If you're fairly new to making garments, pick something easy to work with on this one. Wools, heavier weight cottons, they're going to be ideal. Um, Imitation silk, like nylons, polyesters, for your lining material are probably going to be your best bet on that front as well. Nice, stable, predictable fabrics. If it's your first attempt, don't spend a lot of money. I would strongly recommend that you buy just affordable fabric, even use old bed sheets. Make yourself a mock-up first, get the hang of how this goes together, because waistcoats are simultaneously very simple and straightforward and also quite frustrating because you've got to be so precise with lining up all of your smaller details and the method of turning the garment the right side out when you've sewn it together 
can be a little bit of a, a brain twister. Once you're a bit more comfortable with the process, then by all means, go and buy whatever fabric you like, but I would strongly recommend use something affordable to begin with. Let me know what you think in the comments, and let me know if this is an adventure that you've made, or if there's something else you would like to see me make in the future. I'm all ears. Well, not literally all ears, that'd be weird. Yeah. Ideally, you will already have a waistcoat to work from. I'm not going to be showing pattern drafting in this video. I'm not going to go into that because that's not something I have a lot of experience with. Instead, I'm going to show you how to copy this waistcoat and make this waistcoat. Obviously, this one isn't finished yet. We'll come to that. I wear this waistcoat a lot. It's an everyday garment for me. It's comfortable and it needs some repair. The biggest problem is around the back. You can see it's got these wrinkles in it. You can't press them out and get them to stay out. The belt on the back also needs repairing and the buckle has gone missing at some point. Ideally, I need to dismantle this, reline it, start again. I like the Harris Tweed that it's made out of, everything else needs to go. But, I don't want to dismantle this and then have no everyday waistcoat. So that's what we're doing here. You might have a favourite garment that you want to copy, either to make it in a different fabric or the same fabric, but you don't have a pattern for it. First thing you need to do is actually lay the garment out and have a look at it, understand how it's constructed. This waistcoat has no darts or any shaping on the front panels. That makes your life a lot easier. Some will have a dart here, some will have a seam that comes round. If it's a good flat one like this, you've not got to worry about the added complication of working out where seams go. So that's quite useful. Equally on the back, this waistcoat is just one panel. There are two seams here, which I think are very small darts, and they hold in the adjustment strap. I'm not going to put these darts in, I'm actually going to make the back panel just flat. You can do that, that's not a problem, because I think these darts are what's contributing to this creasing up problem on the back. And I think that's just down to my body shape. Literally the first job that you need to do is lay the garment out flat, on your paper. It doesn't have to be pattern paper like this. You can use the back of wrapping paper. Quite often these days that has a grid printed on it so that can help you with alignment. Or any sort of lightweight paper that you've got. You can even tape together printer paper and use that. Well that's a bit fiddly. Once you've got your garment laid out nice and flat, your important thing is as you trace around it, you can see up here on the shoulder how it sort of bunches up. So as you trace, just make sure your fabric's flat and hold it as you pull the garment flat against the paper. If it crumples up at the other end where you've already traced, that doesn't matter. What matters is that you keep your reference points. Once you trace this out, you can then mark out where your pockets go. Pocket proportion on waistcoats is very important. If you get it even slightly off, they look very weird. So it's best to copy what you've got, if you can. There's various different ways to do that. You can put the garment face down and mark the paper. You can lay the paper over the top of this and trace through. Choose a method that works for you. It will be different for each person and different for each garment, which is why I can't tell you one exact answer. When it comes to doing the back panel, this one's a little bit more difficult than the front because it doesn't want to lay flat as much. And when you trace it, you do have to be careful of where your various lines are. So what you might find is you trace around the back panel and then you have to correct things afterwards. You have to change a few lines just to make everything square. What's most important is this seam here should be the same length on both pieces if it's this style. 
some waistcoats have a split here and step the front down. Usually they're like this. Same method as with the front, you just hold it down carefully and trace around your shape. Once you've got your back panel drawn out and cut out, fold your paper in half because this is mirrored. So you want this to be the same on both sides and when you trace you might find it slightly wonky. Your pattern should end up looking something like this. It's also important to make some notes on your pattern itself. I'll bring you in a bit closer so you can see those. A waistcoat can be very simple. You can break it down into basically these three pattern pieces and that's all you need. I do like to mark down which side of the garment the panel is and how many of each type I need. So front times two is the facing fabric, so that would be the tweed on the original and lining times two would be, well, as it sounds, the lining fabric. I don't need to put down that I need to mirror this, but if you need to be reminded of that, do write down that you need to do a mirrored copy. I also mark where the buttonholes went, and I mark the pocket. Now this is actually quite important, because depending on the waistcoat, some pockets slope, some pockets are straight, some pockets are interesting shapes. If you're copying a garment, this and its proportions is very, very important. So pay special attention to that. I like the shape of the front of the waistcoat, so I'm keeping that. But if you want to change a detail on a waistcoat, it's very easy to chop across or bring this down or change the shape. It's a really good way of changing the style without changing the fit. For the back of the garment, I know that I need this piece, uh, I need two full size pieces but on the fold. Now when I say on the fold, this line here is the centre line of the back. So when you use your fabric, fold the fabric in half and then the fold of the fabric goes along here. Speeds up the cutting out process a little bit. And you can see with the pocket, it's a peculiar shape but this is the pocket flap and the reason it's this peculiar shape is that this pocket doesn't sit horizontally like that, it sits at an angle and it folds in half so this is why your pocket marking is very important because that will dictate the proportions it's a welt pocket type on this one what you can do is if you're not confident with doing pockets, just cut out this piece and sew it on the top. I'm probably going to actually put pockets in because I have a pocket watch. But if you don't want to do that, then just sew it on the top and nobody will ever know. The only thing that's not here is the adjustment strap for the back. That's just a rectangle of fabric. That's why I haven't included it. And now you have a waistcoat pattern you can use. I've gone ahead and cut all the fabric out. You saw that at the beginning of the video. It's important when you make your pattern pieces to decide whether or not you're going to include seam allowance. If you're just starting out, do write this on your pattern, because until you find which you prefer, you may find that your early patterns are inconsistent, and that can cause you a bit of a headache later on. I always do no seam allowance on the pattern. I just find it easier, and it's what I'm used to now. As you can see, this is how your pattern pieces lay out. We have two front pieces in the velvet. If you're using velvet, be aware of the pile. I should have chosen a simpler fabric for this particular tutorial, but never mind. Uh, velvet is directional. I would recommend using a non-directional fabric if you're going to do this for your first attempt. The important thing as well is to reverse the pattern. This is the pattern as we drafted it and then for the other side you simply turn it over and then you have the reverse. Do the same thing for the lining and the same thing for the pockets. That's why this pattern piece is over here and not over here. For the back panel you can see it's only half the size of the actual fabric that we've got. 
and that's because when you cut it out, you fold it like so, and cut out the fabric folded. And then for doing your, because you'll need two for the back, so for doing your second one, you can either fold and cut a new piece, or you can lay your first fabric piece onto your second piece, and then they'll match. That's quite important. One of the things I have done on this pattern, and you may notice this on the finished garment, is I did make some minor adjustments. I've raised the line of the neck, and I've raised the armhole line to fit me better. This is just personal choice. When you draft your first pattern, I'd recommend just copying using inexpensive fabric and just learn with your first one. And after that, when you've got a bit of confidence, a bit of experience, then you can start making some changes. I've also altered the armhole on the back to match. All this will do is just raise up the front of the fabric so it just fits me a little bit better and looks a bit smarter with my shirts. It means I have to add one more button, but I've got plenty of buttons, so we'll be fine. The first bit of sewing to do on the body is just to do the shoulder seams on the front and the rear panel. I'm using an online guide which is incredibly useful. To work out how to turn the waistcoat the right way out I had a look online which is a very useful resource and I found this little blog and it goes through all of the steps that you need to actually turn the thing the right way out. Using that sewing guide I can work out how exactly I want to go about turning this out. Now, when I first started doing waistcoats, I couldn't get my head around this. And I'd end up with a waistcoat sewn together in such a way it became a Mobius strip. So you were perpetually turning it inside out and you never actually managed it. On this one, we'll go around the armhole, leave this seam here, which is the one that goes along your side, and then we'll start from the bottom of the front all the way around, around the neck, all the way around, and then stop at this side. There's a reason for this, which will become clear in a moment. Once I've got all that sewn, I can turn the front inside out, well, right way out, it's now inside out, and then I can sew these side seams, and then I can sew the bottom hem. With all of this sewn together, the next step is to clip all the corners, it's just draped loosely on the mannequin at the moment. And of course we haven't sewn up this seam which goes along the side and we haven't sewn up the one that goes along the bottom. Because when you've turned it all the right way out again that's when you'll sew the sides because you can turn them out through the bottom of the waistcoat. The other thing to bear in mind which side is it? Here we are you will want to figure out where the waist strap is going to go if you're using one. And I know on this waistcoat they're about the same level as the pockets. If you're using velvet, well done, it's a nightmare to press it. So don't expect nice sharp edges because you'll end up with shiny seams unless you've got a special velvet pressing board, which most of us don't own. I would strongly recommend, if this is your first time doing this, do not use the fabrics I've used. They were a bad idea um, for doing a tutorial. But you still treat it the same as you would any other fabric, mostly. So you can still clip your corners and you can still give it a light press from the back. But if you're in a position where you have to press the front, it's best to use some toweling, uh, like a tea towel or a hand towel, between the iron and the velvet. Otherwise you'll crush the pile on the velvet and it will just go shiny and you'll lose all of that stuff that gives the velvet the look it's got. The other thing is, if you're using, this must be a rayon or some sort of, I don't know. It's a beautiful fabric to look at. It's a horrible fabric to sew. So 
Again, don't use whatever this is. <laughs> oh. My window of recording light is going away. Problems with doing these jobs in the winter. However, we have everything turned out. It's not pressed yet. I've not done any of the pressing at all. If you're working with a fabric like velvet where you have issues with it pressing and you want a sharp edge, your easy answer is to very carefully pin all of your edges and then just do a top stitch, either in the same thread or an opposing thread. If you follow the pile of the fabric, it will sew easier on your machine because when you've got velvet, it's like there's lots of little fingers and they lay one way but won't go the other. So as long as you follow it, so with this fabric, the pile's going that way, if I go that way, I can feel it sort of standing up against my hand. It makes it easier to sew. If you try and sew against the grain on velvet, it will try and walk in a direction you don't want it to. If you try and sew with the grain on velvet, it tries to reduce the amount of friction and then it can be very difficult to sew a straight line. Long story short, velvet is a nightmare to work with. <laughs> You've got to really want to work with it to use it. But uh, I like it. I think this is turning out okay so far. The next job will be joining the seams together. And this is why we left all of the bottom open. Because we can basically half turn it inside out. So we'll sort of take this side of the garment and flip it over the front. You can then sew down the outside and the inside side seam. Once you've done that, you can finish off the hem quite easily. Picking which buttons to use on this waistcoat was tricky. Originally, I thought I'd just pick something the same or similar colour to the waistcoat. The nearest I had is this one up here. It's a good colour match, but the button's too big. So I had to look through what other reds and pinks I've got, and everything was the wrong colour. The contrast was either too great, or not great enough, or when it was put against this fabric, it looked a completely different colour. Here's some of the button options. And you can see this one's an excellent colour against the fabric, but it's too big, it's the wrong kind of style. This one looks almost purple, and these two are much, much too pale, which is a shame because I really like the design on this one. And then the other half said, what about using black buttons? Because the back of the waistcoat has these black stripes on it. So that's what I did. I've gone with these floral type ones. Not my first choice. These are the buttons I'm going to go with. I think they're supposed to imitate jet buttons. They have that sort of a look about them. Um, they're only plastic, they're, they're not a special material. But if you were doing a uh, a Victorian garment, these wouldn't actually be too far off. They'd have the right sort of look. Jet does have a very different way of catching the light than plastic does, but trying to find jet buttons, let alone afford them, is quite difficult these days. Unfortunately, my first choice, which were some nice polished hexagon buttons, I don't have enough for this waistcoat, because I need six buttons on this waistcoat. And this is all to do with proportions. I tried it with five on the front, and the gaps are too large. And obviously, with this size of button, seven would be too many. But I had six of these, and it turned out to be just the right amount. They're the right sort of size for the waistcoat, and the floral design of them, it sort of fits in with the fact it's velvet, so it's quite soft, and just aesthetically, it lines up. Now that I've decided what buttons I'm going to use, the next task is to sew the side seams so we can finish all the machine sewing. I might need to top sew these outer seams because this fabric doesn't like to hold a crease and velvet is notorious for not holding a crease. So I may need to top stitch just to get a smart finish. But we'll see when I've finished doing all the seams and we've turned it the right way out again. On our last bit of machine sewing on this, we're closing up the seams. The first bit that you need to join together is going to be your seam here, at the bottom of the arm eye. 
So this is your seam that runs around the armhole, or eye as it gets called. Don't worry about how long or not your back seam is, because we can adjust this afterwards. Now I'm going to turn this waistcoat out through this inside seam. So all we'll be sewing on this side seam here is just the top few inches like this and the bottom few inches and then you'll leave the middle bit unsewn. And to do the front of the waistcoat I hope this explains it because it's one of those where it's a bit tricky to explain but makes a lot of sense when you're actually doing it. So this front seam that will sew just all the way down as normal. Your only difference here, if you're using an adjustment strap, you want to pin that in place where you want it because that will be caught in this seam here. Now, depending on the approach you've taken will depend what you're going to do. I'm just using a simple ribbon type strap. This is just a length of the same fabric sewn into a tube, turned the right way out and pressed. So there's just a centre seam on the back. You've seen me do these before. This means then I don't need a buckle, I can just tie it in a bow on the back. I do need to shorten this one a little bit. I'm just going to pin this together and hopefully that will explain a bit better what I've actually done here and what you need to do for this particular seam. This is the normal side, the side we're not turning through. And all I've done is I've just pinned the whole thing around and you can just do this all in one run. Leave the bottom open for now, you don't need to worry about that bit. It's just the side seams. And as long as your front pieces and your back pieces, so your front outer and your front lining, and your back outer and back lining, are pinned to one another, but not together like this, you'll be okay. On the other side, it's pinned slightly differently. On this side, which is the side you're going to turn out, we've pinned it the same way, so the front outer and the front lining to one another, and then the back outer and back lining to one another, and it's all one loop. What I'd recommend, pin the whole thing around and then take two pins out, if you have a pin spacing similar to mine, and this will leave you about a hand's width, a bit more. That's where we're going to turn this out through. If you're not confident at this, just do these as one whole seam and turn it out through the bottom instead. But honestly, this method is worth doing. You get a much tidier finish when you're done. We need to finish off this hem here. Everything is lined up nicely on the sides. The strap is caught into this seam, that's quite important. And then I will catch it again on the back because I don't want it loose all the way around. If you actually catch it around about here on the back then it only cinches in this little bit here and the waistcoat just sits a bit nicer. This is where we turn out the waistcoat. So this is the section that I didn't sew and it means that you can reach through and pull the bottom hem out through that gap. So effectively, you'll turn the waistcoat inside out for the bottom seam through this unsewn section, sew it up, turn it the right, right way out back through that seam, and then you can either machine sew or hand sew this slot closed. The other handy thing about doing this is it means if in the future one of your pockets wears out on the inside, you can unpick the stitching here and get to the pocket and repair it, which is very useful, especially if you had a waistcoat a very long time and the pockets have worn out. All the machine sewing is now finished. I did end up having to top stitch over the velvet and I carried that on all the way around the back, so every single like outer edge now has a seam on it that's visible. This wasn't what I originally planned to do, but it's down to the fabric I'm using. 
both of these fabrics are difficult. They both want to do their own thing, and I could not get this to press well at all. The velvet would hold a nice crease, but then whatever the lining fabric I'm using is, it just doesn't want to press, and they were just pulling each other out, so best just to stitch it. It doesn't look terrible. The only thing is, the only regret, a patch pocket would have looked better than a welt pocket with this. But that's by the by. This waistcoat is designed to do what this waistcoat does, which is just be an everyday garment so I can wear it whatever I'm doing and not worry about it. Not making something fancy. And it's just to demonstrate that you can make a garment by copying one that you've already got. And, and here you go, you can see the before and the after. And it shows just how wrinkly and how desperately in need of a press this one is. But with this one, all I need to do now is the hand sewing, which means closing that inside seam that we turned everything out through and putting the buttons and buttonholes on. Once that's done, this is finished and I can wear it straight away. On the back, as you can see, I still haven't trimmed down the ribbon, but I did catch the ribbon here with a little square of sewing and that just brings in this section here so as my waist size goes up and down as it likes to do I can adjust this in and out as I need to so it will fit me and it will always look smart on the front I'll uh, get the hand sewing done and I'll just bring you in so you can have a closer look at some of the details here and see how that actually looks